Hi, welcome to Omaha, Nebraska. I'm John Francis, and today we're going to look at the New Deal and the birth of American art. The area we're going to look at is actually south of where we are now, Nebraska, right in the middle there of the Great Plains. A huge area of the prairies that goes from Texas right up to the Canadian border there. And the time we're going to look at is the 1930s, and we're going to look at this area, uh, the Dust Bowl, which is in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, that area where in the 1930s, the topsoil had all blown off, uh, the, were, the farmers were very poor, and it was almost the end of farming. Roosevelt was the president at that time that was in a very difficult situation. He had to try and get the farmers and the workers working in industry and artists working again. So in his New Deal, he promised jobs, houses, social security, the right to unionize labor, medical facilities for everyone, and education. And in many ways, it was a socialist agenda. But it was a very exciting and very important time for visual artists and painters. And that's what we're going to look at in particular, how this area in the 1930s helped uh, bring about the foundation of modern art in America. First image we're going to look at is uh, an image of this new society that was being built by Roosevelt, which attempted almost to be the nanny state and to look after all the needs of all the people. And this is a poster here by a, a graphic artist here, encouraging people to look after their babies in certain ways. Also, if we look at this other poster, which is uh, lack, called Lack of Funds, encouraging people to actually seek medical assistance should they need it. And right at the end here, we've got actually a little menu from a school and right at the bottom there, if you can see it, it says WPA School Lunch. WPA was the Works Project Administration, which is what the artists uh, came under. The posters that came out at that time, done by the graphic artists, this is a sample of them here, public service one on the left there in the top corner, don't mix them, the idea about mixing, drinking and driving, of course, not a good idea. Programs for women artists, you can see at the bottom there on the left. And then we've got theatre up in New York City there and programs to encourage people to be healthy and wealthy and wise, I suppose. So uh, all encompassing program, but particularly we're going to look at how the program that, that FDR provided for artists at that time and how that was manifested in what was happening in that Dust Bowl area and how various artists and photographers in particular went down there. The uh, Federal Art Project, which was the umbrella organization that the WPA came under, uh, funded 5,000 artists. 2,000 and 25,000 works of art were created at that time. So a huge boom in the arts that uh, really meant a program of arts for, for everyone. It, it was a chance that people in rural communities could actually see uh, art for the first time in many cases. Uh, as you can see from the statistics down here, over half of the artists employed were fine artists, easel painters, muralists. Jackson Pollock was one of those painters and we'll refer to him a bit later in the talk. Practical arts, photography, designers, uh, etc. were also catered for, funded, given money to live on week after week, month after month, year after year. Education too was very important within the program. If we look at what was happening in New, in New York and, and the East and the power center of America at that time, under that WPA umbrella, we had Arthur Rothstein, and Arthur Rothstein had only just graduated from uh, university when he started to work for the uh, 
federal government under one of these programs. And he was a photographer, and he went down to the south, to the Dust Bowl, to photograph what was going on there. And it should be remembered that photography at that time was a really important developing mass media. There was no television, remember? And what was happening in the newspapers and particularly magazines is that photojournalism was really taking off. And if we look at magazines like Life magazine and Fortune magazine, we'll see the way images and photography were, were a way of creating new information and new truth uh, for, for Americans. So the first photograph, that, or the most famous photograph that uh, Rothstein took was this one. This photograph is a very powerful photograph. It's a very minimal photograph. There's not much in it. Uh, in it, we see a man uh, who's, who's uh, going towards his shack. He's a uh, sharecropper. He's a farmer who owns nothing. And because of the over stripping away the, uh, the soil and not fertilizing and irrigating the, the farms properly, and the dust storms at that time were able to take away the topsoil from the farms in that area and leave the farmers with almost nothing. This was a huge disaster. And this photograph kind of works on two levels. It's informational, it tells us exactly what it was like visually at that time, but it also was a way of, of, of uh, the government using this new information to justify the, the large amounts of money that they were starting to pump into this area to, to farming. So artists were involved and had this social consciousness of, of recording what was going on. Another artist at that time who was very important is Dorothea Lange. And Dorothea Lange made her money in San Francisco. She photographed the great and the good. She um, was a kind of high society in some ways photographer, but with a social conscience. And she went to that area uh, and took these photographs. And you can see on the right there, a dust storm kind of blowing in and taking almost everything in its wake. And these dust storms, by the way, were very, very powerful and they lasted and roamed right across the country. And it's said that even in uh, Washington DC, in the Oval House, when uh, Roosevelt was looking at his papers on his desk, that when there was a storm, that it would eventually leave a layer of dust on those documents. So these are hugely um, natural phenomena that was really physically changing America, the farming and the people who had to, to live there. So Dorothy Lang uh, established a huge reputation and then was employed by the WPA to take photographs uh, of that area. This is one of her most famous photographs. It's a photograph uh, of a migrant family. This, this family would have, I think they were involved in a pea picking activity in the area that they were in. They were extremely poor. They'd, it's been documented they slept under bridges. Uh, this lady, Florence Owens Thompson, was actually a Cherokee Indian, born in Oklahoma, born in a teepee. She had seven children and she was just 32 years of age. And this is a very important photograph, I think, and it's very important. It became a, an icon of that 1930s depression time. How we read this photograph is, I think we look at her body and we look at her hands and we look at her expression and we, we start to feel through her body what her inner state of mind uh, and being was like. And of course, she was a woman who was def desperately worried and desperately concerned about her plight of uh, trying to survive in that terrible time. Also, the photograph shows her children who, who again give us impact to the image by looking away from the camera. It seems to be that they're just so ashamed that they won't even look at the camera. Another very famous photograph that we'll look at here, and this is called White Angel. And actually, White Angel is the name of the, the, the lady who used to run the soup kitchen 
that uh, is going on in, in the background there. These men are queuing for soup. They're queuing to stay alive. They're queuing to have some sort of dignity. And we can see here that there's one man here who seems to be uh, have rejected that. If we look at his hands, if we look at the way his hands seem pressed together there uh, and the way he's looking down, we can't see his face, but um, he's we see that his cup is empty and he's turned around. He's, he's rejected uh, queuing up to try and survive. It's a very desolate, very lonely kind of image that I'm sure changed the minds of of many people and set a lot of questions going about how should we treat our people? How should we look after each other in this uh, American time where things were, were bad? Another photograph uh, by Margaret Brook White this time, who worked for Life magazine uh, at one point. Uh, we see again this kind of divide being set up here between those that have and those that don't have. And in the foreground, we can see the black Americans queuing for subsidies for food hangouts. Things aren't working very well in the American dream. Behind them, we can see propaganda, actually, if you like, which has come from the government because the government in many ways was under threat because it seemed like the American dream, this idea of the world's highest standard of living, there's no way like the American way, as it says in the poster, uh, wasn't really true. And Americans were really questioning that. Um, why, you know, why is it that we're, we're in this wealthy country and yet we're not doing very well? There's obviously that racial element to this because the people in the shiny car who are doing really well are all white. And even their dog is white. Let's move on to uh, what was happening in, in that era in the Dust Bowl. We've got Woody Guthrie here, photograph here with his guitar. The Machine Kills Fascist. He was a socialist, maybe a communist as well. And he grew up in that area in Oklahoma. And he seemed to be uh, representative of those dispossessed people of that area in the south and southwest. Uh, the slogan there on the top, Okies and dogs not allowed inside, would have been a very popular sign that you would have seen in the highways and cafes and shops um, if you were traveling in your old jalopy uh, bound for uh, the California line and the so-called promised land. But of course, many of them, when they got to California, weren't allowed in because they didn't have the money. Uh, so Woody Guthrie seemed to sing about those people uh, in his songs. He wrote three, over 3,000 songs and was hugely influential later on. Uh, you may recognize the chap there on the right with a cigarette in his mouth. That's Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan from the 1960s, who, who was a protest singer and hugely influenced by Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie went on to to write one of the greatest songs, I think, that represents that era. This land is your land, this land is my land. And that song was later taken up by Bruce Springsteen, often called the boss of rock music. And in that uh, song, Springsteen performed many times, but particularly at the inauguration celebration for President Obama back in 2003. So this land is your land is saying that maybe the in the New Deal should change things. But let's remember that if we look at this map on the left, where the Comanches, the Indian, the Native Americans, Indian, this was their land. They were the people who were born there. And this area of the Dust Bowl is the area where they roamed in, in their numbers and, and lived off the buffalo and lived very frugally, unlike what the white man had done with the exploitation of the, the soil and the grazing areas in the Great Prairies. That is sitting bare on the right there, one of their, their leaders. Let's hear a, just a little short clip of that famous song by Woody Guthrie. There was a big high wall there that tried to stop me. The sign was painted 
once had private property But on the back side it didn't say nothing This land was made for you and me So that song really tells us about um, the two sides of America The corporate side, the advertising, selling things to people who were lucky enough to buy And the other side uh, of the sign where people didn't have anything And they didn't own anything and they weren't doing uh, very well this image here that we see uh, below is by an artist who was actually quite famous at that time, Ben Shahn. And Ben Shahn was uh, an artist who was involved in mural painting, as many of them were. And it was this move to realism. Realism was really important in the 30s. And it was a, an attempt to uh, America to document itself and its history through, through realism. And here we have Ben Shahn's painting of a riveter. This uh, formed part of a post office in, uh, in the Bronx in New York. So mural painting was very, very popular um, across America um, by the uh, Roosevelt's New Deal WPA uh, fund that had been set up to support artists uh, during this time. Ben Shahn was also a photographer. And if we see this image on the right, we see his concerns about the racial divides, particularly in the South at that time. This photograph that he took in the South shows the inside of a sharecropper's house. And of course, what we're seeing there is, is uh, extreme poverty. We're shocked by that. We're, it elicits these questions with us. Why? What, why is this happening? Um, why is somebody that's so poor that they have to just put images from a newspaper onto their walls instead of wallpaper? Going then to Jackson Pollock, and Jackson Pollock uh, was a WPA-funded artist. He was from Wyoming, and he painted this uh, painting in 1934, Going West, and apparently he used some of his the photographs he took in Wyoming to paint this. But it's very much a dystopian almost image of the frontier days of the wagon trains going towards the promised land and how difficult that promised land was. So Jackson Pollock was hugely important and we know that he became very successful uh, in the 1950s. But at that time, he was influenced by the great painter uh, Thomas Hart Benson. And Thomas was somebody who uh, painted uh, rural images and stories about the history of America. We'll see one in, in a minute. So Jackson Pollock then was, uh, became the quintessential American modern artist. He was funded by the WPA many many years during the 1930s he got into psychoanalytic theory into abstraction into playing around with pure paint uh, with the idea of improvisation which of course was an idea that was in the air that jazz music uh, was using and he was part of a group of artists who formed the first truly american form abstract expressionism and the area is dripping away his paint here's one by his mentor thomas hart benson uh, and if you look very carefully uh, to the bottom right hand corner you can see a little baby's bottom being powdered there but there's all sorts of images about the history and the work and the progress of america we come to uh, Stuart Davis, who was an artist at that time, who was moving towards Expressionism. And particularly that idea that, that improvisation and abstract art went together. They were part of the same thing. And if you can see the writing on the left there, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing, uh, is written in the top. So he used text as well. Uh, he used very, in his other paintings, he used uh, uh, commercial images. And he's very much a kind of a, a pop and abstract painter uh, way ahead of his time. 
So finally, we've got this photograph from 1950, Life magazine. These people, the artists in this painting, in this photograph, had all been become really successful. The art of uh, the art center of the world had now moved firmly to New York City, where all these artists were, and America had now established itself as the center of the art world in the world. Uh, we can see that by Mark Rothko sitting on the front there in a chair with his glasses on, Jackson Pollock smoking a cigarette with a bald head in the middle, uh, William de Kooning there, the great abstract painter on the far top left hand corner there and we've got Hedda Stern there standing up the only female artist represented so here we have then the evidence of the amazing work that that had been started by uh, Roosevelt and the New Deal via the WPA and creating the great success of a mod of modern art in America thanks for listening my name is John Francis and all aboard now, on to Chicago!